welcome to the new season of Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pena. We're here at the performance mecca of the world, Times Square, and that's because we're kicking off this season with a look at performers across the CUNY spectrum. We have a Broadway actor, a young comedian, a performance artist, and so much more. So let's get this started. First up, one seasoned Broadway actor has a very down-to-earth approach to performing on the world's brightest stage. Let's take a look. I'm a character actor. That's what I do. Like a carpenter, like a, like a plumber. That's, that's how I see myself. I don't see it as anything uh, romantic in, in any way. Uh, there's a craft, and I try my best to uh, work at the craft. I like seeing the different quirks of different characters and getting inside their heads and walking differently and talking differently and uh, thinking differently. That's why I think of myself as a uh, just an average Joe, a union guy. I've been a character actor my whole life. It's just that, you know, usually character actors blossom in their, you know, in their 50s and their 60s. And I've been lucky enough to uh, have things happen for me earlier on. This is my 31st year uh, in the business. I'm sure that you have heard the name of Dolfo. When I was in L.A. not too long ago, a casting director said to me, I know why I don't recognize you. She said, I've seen you in many things over the years, you know, in television and films and, and also on stage. It's just that you're completely different every time. And I take that as a huge compliment. I take it very seriously when I go out on stage. My favorite times are when I walk out of the stage door and people go, no, not him. He wasn't in the show. You know what I mean? That's, then I know I've done my job because, you know, I don't look like me. How the world can change. It can change. I'm playing Herr Schultz in Cabaret on Broadway. One little word, married. Me being on stage in the show, it's, it's uh, an unbelievable honor to be working on this show. Directors, Sam Mendes and Rob Marshall, they've taken this show, which was already a masterpiece, and elevated it to such a wonderful level. I've never worked with a more uh, stunning or talented ensemble. They're incredible. They sing, they dance, they act, and they play the score. Michelle Williams and Alan Cumming. He is amazing. He is uh, an actor's actor. Linda Eamon is the character, is the uh, actress that I play opposite. Uh, Fräulein Schneider is the, her character, and uh, we have a very interesting love story. If you come see Cabaret early on, you'll see one thing, and if you see it another, two months later, I hope you'll see something better and richer and deeper and more real. You don't think it would be better simply to go on as before? When I was 11, my dad gave me a copy of Peer Gint. <laughs> Uh, Ibsen's play. I could relate easily to the dialogue form. I saw myself in it, I saw myself writing it. I could all of a sudden really understand each person's point of view. The dialogue form seemed to be on such a human level that I understood it immediately. I owe everything I am as a professional actor to Ed Greenberg, uh, who I met at Queens College. Ed was my mentor. He taught me pretty much everything I know about the business uh, of the theater and also began to teach me the most important things about acting, like listening. I would not be here in this dressing room right now. I would not have uh, the career I've had that I've been lucky enough to have uh, if he hadn't started me off. My son just got accepted into the Aaron Copeland School of Music. My father teaches there. My mother went there. Uh, my mother also went to Brooklyn College for her master's. My two brothers went there. I went there. And now my son is going there. So we're keeping it all in the family. When I was younger, I, I realized I had to, in order to make it, I had to spread myself thin. Uh, but as I've gotten older, I'm starting to get offered great roles in different things. And uh, people are saying, wow, isn't it wonderful getting offers for things? And I keep telling them, well, it's, you know, it's only taken me 30 years <laughs> for that to happen. 
and uh, it's 30 years of hard work. I feel like it's just starting to pay off. I'm just starting to get good. I can sing it very slowly. Michael Mossman has played with some of the world's greatest jazz legends. He's a trumpeteer and a music arranger and is in demand around the world. From entertaining the crowd at the U.S. Open, to conducting a Spanish orchestra, to writing a jazzy arrangement of the South African National Anthem. He's, uh, he's like the Pied Piper. He starts to play and people want to be part of what he's doing. One, two, one, two, three, four. in some ways kind of like a jazz tourist because I came to New York in the early 80s playing avant-garde jazz with people like Roscoe Mitchell, Anthony Braxton, at a time when that music was real, still pretty strong, you know, uh, very much more prevalent than it, than it is now. But pretty soon I started playing, getting very much swept up in hard bop because there were so many great players, so uh, apart from my group Out of the Blue uh, with Blue Note, I, you know, had a chance to play with Art Blakey and Horace Silver. Uh, and then uh, I wound up playing with a lot of big bands. So I, I've worked with Lionel Hampton and I work with uh, Toshiko Akiyoshi. And, you know, I, I got a chance to play cool school music with Jerry Mulligan. So it's just like almost every school of jazz, and of course all my association with, with uh, Afro-Cuban and, and, and so-called Latin jazz. This movie, Chico and Rita, um, involved very much the work of Babel Valdez, the father of Chucho Valdez who was the musical director of the Tropicana nightclub just before the revolution in Cuba. And Babel had a very interesting story. And I had recorded with Babel. So I had been involved with a lot of the groups that were represented in the film. In fact, in the film, I played Dizzy Gillespie, literally on my trumpet. So I would played with Dizzy and, you know, and I had been familiar with Babel and I'd worked with Babel and, and he knew that I had a long association with this music. So we used a lot of Babel's music and I scored a lot of the music for orchestra, for jazz band, for singers, diff diff for a lot of different groups and, and played, you know, played and, and, and directed. And, and it's a wonderful story, really. It's a beautifully done movie. It was nominated for an Academy Award. In Washington, D.C., there is a uh, festival producer by the name of Charlie Fishman, and as part of his festival, he commissioned me to write uh, a suite um, based on the music of Duke Ellington, actually a list of songs that there was requested, and arrange that for the Chico O'Farrell Orchestra. So the Chico O'Farrell Orchestra performed in the festival. They performed that suite, and later Bobby Sanabria requested the suite to, to use with his, his band, and I, you know, I gave it to him because Bobby had given me so much that I gave him this chart. And he recorded it, and it, it garnered a Grammy nomination. Right now I'm working on a piece for a German youth band that's going to do a tour of South Africa. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm doing Nkosi Sikalele, which is the uh, South African national anthem. So I'm doing a jazz version of that for choir and uh, for a jazz band. He's uh, uh, a trumpet player, a composer, an arranger, uh, and, uh, and a teacher. He's the head of the jazz program at Queens College, and in that capacity, he does all those things. The validity of a faculty member like Michael, who is a working jazz musician, for the students to study with and to jam with, and just how today he brought in two students to be part of the ensemble and saying, I need to give them the opportunity, is something really important. Some of our students have already won Grammys. I mean, here at Queens College, um, the line between student and professor and professional is always blurred. And one of the things we do here in, in, in Queens College is we offer, at <laughs> prices you can't beat anywhere, uh, you know, really an amazing professional faculty who are very much engaged and still, you know, very much involved in the profession. So this, this, this constant sharing of information um, is, 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 is what we do. And it's, it's a great place to be.
Up next, performance artist George Emilio Sanchez describes the impossibility of defining performance art and the challenges in delivering a 90-minute monologue inside a pile of garbage. For me, my inroad to performance was that it was a way for me to make something original using my own experience, my own imagination in an interdisciplinary way and make something that was, in the beginning, especially when I first started, autobiographical pieces and um, mixing prose and poetry, not being, it was not linear, it's not about a character, it was me uh, using other voices. You know, it's really rather astounding how little we, and here I'm including myself, all right, how little we actually think about the meaning, the intent, the interpretation of our daily language. It's really hard to define. It, it certainly is it's something that's time-based. It's something, it's something that's in a person's body. The relationship between audience is really important, but it's different for each performance artist that I know. I say it and I use it, and I per refer to myself as a performance artist. But when people like you say, so what is it? I, it's like, oh my God, it's really tough. Am I living up to your expectations of a, of a boxed-in invalid spouting off like a dead man talking? Because here I am, come on, I'm on the other side of what? Maimed, disproportionate, paralyzed. You know, I came here to be an actor, so I really studied to be an actor. Then working in television and films was like the worst thing ever. It was just the worst, you know? Um, always being a rapist or a thief or a drug addict. I mean, it was just, it got, it got to be too much, you know? And then um, I got really involved with the war in Central America and they were two opposing worlds. My pursuit to become an actor and then my politics about being against the government and its infiltration to Central America. I started working on a play. It was called uh, A Peasant of El Salvador. And that was the initial sort of thing. Well, these guys wrote something about something I care about. Why don't I do that? That, was, that really changed everything for me. Then I didn't have any more interest in continuing to work as an actor. In, the, in, theater, uh, in television and, and film. Like it just, it was a dream I had that all of a sudden just went away, it just disappeared. It's like, no, I want to, I have a voice and I have things I care about and somehow I'm gonna work with this. It was really that simple. And then I started working with my partner, Patricia Hoffbauer. And in 96, we premiered uh, The Architecture of Seeing. And Patricia's a choreographer from Brazil, so she really, you know, uses movement and the body and whatever she makes, so we brought all that together. I've never done anything like buried up to my neck. It's, I'm not, I can't move, and you only see me from the head up, and it's crazy. I basically wrote it on the Staten Island Ferry, and I just um, use it as an opportunity to really address a number of things that I felt were related to everything I was living through at that time as a parent, as an artist, as a professor, as a teacher, as an educator, as a political activist. And I just said, I'm just gonna just throw it out there. Form and content, content and form, the real versus the imagined, abundance versus need, the quiet tension we relentlessly bear to try to escape, the ever-present reminder that this, 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 this is only temporary. When I started to think about this, I had an image of being literally buried in trash. I just wanted trash. Part of that came from working with Marina Abramovich and doing durational work through the re-performance during her time at MoMA. So when I got to do that, I had to be still for two and a half hours and silent. And I did that because I knew it was going to be challenging. I wanted to try something totally different, something completely out of my sphere of experience and performance. And um, for me, it was great. There's nothing greater than that. I mean, I love to perform. I love, I just love it. There are very few places where I feel like so in my body and so present in my life than in a performance. But I don't even really believe in happiness. I mean, it's this nebulous thing. It's worthless to me. I don't really get it. But I certainly want to ask, can we withstand having 300 million people pursue happiness at the same time? Evidently not. In terms of how people live and survive as, as art makers, I don't think there's a structure, uh, certainly not within funding world or in government, that understands the arts, period, let alone experimental artists. I mean, we're really marginalized in many ways. And that's a new venture that I'm getting involved in. How can we get artist voices involved in government, electoral politics, and 
and, and all kinds of organizations so that when people talk about um, the needs of the city, that art is on a priority list and that it's not extracurricular, it's not a last minute thought. I'm really tired of hearing really well-intentioned, articulate, intelligent politicians tell me they love the arts and they really appreciate it. But where's the money? I teach all the time and I don't have to teach as much as I do, but I love teaching more than I love being chair. Mostly courses now that have to do with more performance or making a performance. I love seeing the, the eyes, the light go off. I love seeing the light go off. Something will happen in the semester where it all comes together and it's, it's just amazing. I'm just shocked you even called me up, so you know, I'm just, I'm still in shock, so uh, that's great. Yeah. Back in 2012, CUNY added its seventh community college. Located in the heart of the city, Gutman Community College has already graduated its first class. I had no idea that the, I would get these experiences from here and leave with a family that I would be with forever. Um, it's just been an incredible experience. There's so much support at Gutman that I knew that I had someone by my side every step of the way. I believe the SSAs from the teachers, the president, the faculty, everybody helped me get to where I am now. Our first students came um, on August 20, 2012. We greeted them at the first day of the bridge program, took their picture on the steps in the front of New York Public Library. Two years later, a fair number of those students in the first class are graduating. That We had kind of a placeholder number for the what we thought the two-year graduation rate might be uh, in a planning document that said 5%. And it turns out that 28% are going to graduate. Gottman, I actually has a place in my heart. I'm going to definitely come back and visit often because that's, this is where I feel like I belong. The planning that went into the college and the really hard work that the faculty and staff have done here have really played off by getting students very engaged in their learning. The students are able to talk about what they've learned. They keep electronic portfolios with samples of their work. They reflect upon that work and I think have really enriched the college in great ways because before the students were here it was ideas, they were great ideas, but now the campus has turned out so well because we have real students, a, a graduating class who set a very high level for all the future classes. They've been so supportive of me and what I want to do. I filmed my uh, web series there, I had the premiere there, so it's just been a blessing. So they've just been so supportive and motivate me to be where I'm at today. Government worked out so well for me, I recommended it to my brothers for him to go and try it. They've been partners um, in building this college. It was an empty building uh, till they came and now, you know, they're known quantity. But we really stress um, the learning outcomes and they can celebrate that learning as they go on and complete their four-year degrees. Spoken word, poetry slams. These phrases conjure up beatnik cliches, but the reality is far removed from the stereotype. New York City's spoken word culture is a vibrant and engaging community, and one CUNY student has chosen to make this art form a career path. We are told mistakes by our elders, painful memories daddy don't want for me. How dare they forget one's dancing in our place. Jarell is an extremely passionate person, and uh, when she came to my series, I had never seen her before, never heard of her before, and the first time she came to the series, she was the last person on stage, and Jarell got on stage with fire. And all of a sudden, all that tired went out of me, and I was glued to her on stage. Welcome to the spoken word poetry of Jarell Ben. Since 2012, under the stage name of Relly the Poet, she has been performing on stage what has sometimes been an underappreciated medium. What is the appeal of poetry? The appeal of poetry is that there are really no boundaries. There are no boundaries. Like, for instance, I hate math because there's one answer, you know, and you either right or you're wrong. With poetry, you can never be wrong. Poetry is such condensed language and being able to say a lot in the fewest amount of words, that is a very difficult art form. And, but it's not appreciated. Here at Funkadelic Studios, however, the audience most certainly appreciates it. 
Jarrell took us inside to see what spoken word poetry is all about. Bidding air. Rick James, brick house! At the top of the stairs, I once tumbled down and cried out, looking for a particular grain of sand in the Sahara. Mike Geffner founded the Inspired Word Poetry Series in order to provide a showcase for this art form at venues across the city. If anything, the poetry community in New York City is very fractured. And that was one of my goals when I came into this, is make it less fractured, to create not just an open mic series, not just a poetry series, but to create a community of artists, a family, a way to collaborate with other artists. Right now it's mostly grassroots artists like Jarrell. Jarrell grew up in the Caribbean and has been writing poetry since as long as she can remember. Now living in New York, the last few years have seen her begin classes at Brooklyn College and take her once private poetry from the page to the stage, from a hobby to a career path. Hey, hey, I was going to start out, bust out in the dance, but I'm too classy for that right now. Sorry, y'all. I am process? painstakingly meticulous when it comes to my poetry. A poem is never finished. You can always choose another word, another phrase, another metaphor. You can always change it. We're going to try that again. When you tell people that, oh, I do spoken word poetry, do people have preconceived notions of what that means? I think so. People are like, oh, you know, like, oh, poetry. I wasn't expecting you to say that. They're just thinking something outdated and, like, stuffy and boring, you know? So I think that when they actually do come and see me perform, or maybe I'll spit a few lines for them, then they're like, oh, you're a modern age poet. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm just a poet, you know? Like, <laughs> that's what poetry is. When the average person thinks of spoken word poetry, they're imagining a beatnik in the 1950s with a beret and a turtleneck and bongos in the background. Is that the experience here? When you think of it like that, then you put a limit. You put it in a box and you say, this is what it is, and everything that's not this is not poetry. That's the kind of experience that you should hope to get at the Inspired Word, is a limitless, like, explosion of art. <laughs> I could be a lot nastier, come to think of it. Jarrell wasn't always the confident show stealer she is now. She had never thought much to share her poetry publicly until witnessing a spoken word artist for herself for the first time. Her spoken word was so powerful and so touching. Like, I was like, I need to be doing that. Like, she touched me in a way that I wanted to touch other people like that. Like, I became a toucher. <laughs> so when you are performing, is the goal of it for the other people? Or is the goal of it for you when you're up there? I'm not gonna lie. Um, spoken word poetry cannot just be for yourself, you know? Because that, if that's the case, write a book and sell it. Don't, don't get up on stage and perform at people if you're not gonna try to appeal to them. It's different when some, someone comes up to me like, yo, I felt that. Like, you spoke to me. I heard you. I received you. For everyone here at The Inspired Word, that intimate connection between audience and performer makes spoken word poetry one of the most resonant art forms out there, and for Jarrell, a calling. It fulfills me whether I'm just writing it and reading it to myself or performing it on stage to others. It makes me very happy and it, it fulfills my life and it gives me purpose. Thank you everybody. Yeah! Barry Mitchell introduces us to an outspoken young comedy actress who's been influential in bringing NBC Saturday Night Live into the 21st century. I'm Kay Kennedy from Backstage Access, and we're at Stands of New York where everyone is talking about Moronica, the new pop icon who only burst upon the scene a week ago, but she already has 12 gold records. Let's take a look at her new video, Make It Dash. Got so much cash, I don't need to keep a stash. Make it, make it dash, though. Burn it my cash flow. Veronica is a pop star parody. Celebrities are a little bit irresponsible with the things that they say. So Veronica is like, we just push that to the limit. Make it, make it dash, though. Burn it my cash flow. Veronica is one of the characters created by multi-talented comedian Carrie Cottett. I'm from Brooklyn. I was born and raised there. My background is Caribbean. My parents are West Indian from Trinidad and Guyana. One thing Carrie does not find funny, the scarcity of African-American sketch actresses on TV. 
I wrote an article speaking about SNL and the lack of diversity. For The Atlantic Online and a follow-up article for The Huffington Post. And I pointed out several things. One was that there needs to be diversity in the writer's room in order for anything to happen. And I also talked about the lack of quality roles available for black actresses. Some say Carrie's articles were the kick in the butt SNL needed to hire more black writers and actresses. More about that later. It's the kind of project. It's the kind of project. I started my own sketch comedy web series because I want to I want to do my own thing with my own voice with a more diverse cast. Tired of spending hours just burning in the sun? Sizzle no more. It's blacker tone, a superior suntan lotion. When I wrote blacker tone, it was what does it mean to be black? What are people's perceptions of blackness? 10 out of 10 women said not only did they look blacker, but they felt blacker. I just feel more confident. Terry always knew she'd be an entertainer. I learned that I wanted to do comedy maybe at a pretty early age. I was always performing for my family members. I used to get in trouble for making fun of people, but that was the way like I picked up different accents and dialects and it would always get a laugh, and then I'd probably get in trouble after that because I'd make fun of my mom's friends. Carrie wasn't just a smart aleck. She was smart. I went to Brew College. My majors were psychology and English. My freshman year, I was 16 years old. I did four years in three, and I graduated from Baruch cum laude at 19. When Carrie became serious about comedy, role models were hard to come by. It was like Whoopi Goldberg and no one else. So I didn't know until I turned on YouTube that's when I realized that there were so many other black women doing characters that weren't stereotypical roles. Like, they, they weren't just the loud, angry, ghetto black woman. How about a loud, angry white woman? The gentleman that was behind the counter was very rude and very disrespectful. In what way? It's a weird thing for me to be able to talk like this because people are like, where's this girl from? Who are you? Are you Jewish? You're yelling and you're very aggressive yeah. already. I'm never going to get a role where I can play a white lady from Long Island. So I was like, let's prank call people. Real well, life, I, I need you to situation? admit that, I need you to admit that yeah. you're wrong. Animating it just made sense. And she got to have a life of her own and not be bogged down by my blackness. Shut up right now. Carrie thought her op-ed pieces calling out Saturday Night Live for its lack of diversity would go unnoticed. Why was I wrong? The punchline is Carrie was one of a select group invited to audition for Saturday Night Live executive producer Lorne Michaels. I doubt if they knew that I had written this article when they called me in. I show up at the audition, there were 10 women there, and I was the last to go out. And I had my purse in my hand and I said, they told me I could leave myself backstage, but mm -mm. did you see how many black women they had back there? Got a big laugh. I thought so, because you just, you just have to call it out. You make fun of stereotypes. It's the way that you do it. And earlier this year, SNL did hire three African-American women, a new cast member, and two writers. Does Carrie take credit? Yes, I do. <laughs> I'm very ambitious. I'm happy about the journey, and I'll just see who likes me and who shows up to fill up these seats. K-E-R-R-Y, doing sketch comedy, and I'm not a white guy. That's our show for today. For more information on what you just saw, log on to our website at cuny.tv or check out our Study with the Best Facebook page. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.